Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We all the Breakfast Club. We got some uh, execs in the building to talk about some finances this morning. We had the brother Tony Coles and Charles Phillips. Good morning, brothers. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. How are Thanks y'all, man? Us. They from the Black right. Economic Alliance. Yeah. Black Economic Alliance is. So the, the Black Economic Alliance is an organization that, that got started in 2017. Shortly after the 2016 election, uh, we, we knew that uh, uh, rough times were ahead for black folks in this country. And we decided that we would stand up and uh, take a leadership position. We got about 80 black business people in a room. Uh, we had Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Eric Holder, Deval Patrick, Susan Rice uh, all joined us. And we asked, looked at each other and said, what can we do these next four years to make a difference in the lives of black folks? And the idea of forming an organization that was focused on uh, economic uh, empowerment and creating an economic opportunity agenda for black America was the result. And that's the Black Economic Alliance. So we focus on work, wages, and wealth. So, so how have they showed up? How have y'all showed up the past, the past four years? Because Black people's economic condition sure has changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, is, that is a big part of our work. Charles and I are uh, uh, the uh, leaders and the co-founders of this organization, and we have been focused on working with folks in Washington, working on the Hill, working uh, to the extent we can with anyone who will pay attention to creating more jobs for Black Americans, paying them a fair and decent wage, and using those two things as an avenue to wealth creation, including starting more minority small businesses, uh, where the trend is up for our community, 34% uh, increase in minority small businesses in the last 10 years. And that's the, we're the only racial group where business, uh, 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 business initiation has, uh, has gone up. How has so coronavirus- one of the we did was get part of the lending, the PPP program set, a, set aside for people who lend to black businesses. Mm -hmm. So they got bypassed in the first tranche. We work with the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and a lot of other folks and said, set some aside for the CDFIs and they got lending in the black community to black businesses. So it's things you don't, that aren't apparent, but it was fundamental to saving those companies. Yeah, I was going to ask, how has coronavirus now affected us economically? I know the whole country is, the whole world is uh, different, but how devastating has it been for the Black community in particular? You know, it's, it's been, it's, we've been hit really hard. You know, the, this current administration, Trump keeps saying that, you know, this is the best uh, uh, employment record that Blacks have ever had. I will tell you this, the average unemployment rate is 8%. It's 7% for white Americans. It's almost 13% for Black Americans. So that disparity that existed before COVID has only been accentuated uh, uh, since the pandemic hit. So we're focused on the social justice issues, the economic justice issues, the health justice issues, and we got to address all three of those. But it's, it's really been a problem. And Charles's point about uh, funding minority small businesses and getting money into the communities, our communities, has been has been part of our work these last six months. And how are you guys? When how are you guys doing? Low, we were in the wrong jobs. We try to we got to get out of these low wage jobs and get into higher skilled jobs. That's one of the things we're working on as well. Workforce development programs to get us better training, more funding for that training, and direct connections to companies. Which we have some announcements on that pretty soon. Yeah, I was going to ask. So how are you guys doing? And I know we, we're talking about what we have to do and what we need to do. But what are we doing to make sure that our community is taken care of? Like, what, what are we doing? Are we... Let me give you a couple of examples. So sure. we have about 30 companies who uh, want to hire black people because of what's going on, but they don't know how to find them. At least that's kind of in the history. And there are programs that train and give you specific skill sets. You don't need a college degree, but you need about eight weeks of training to be a computer programmer or a database administrator. So we're forming a black jobs network. Uh, and the goal is to create a million high wage black jobs in the next 10 years. They have committed to hiring. We just got to connect them with the people who do the training. And so we're going to create that network and announce that around January. Question. The other, the other thing, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, the other thing we, we have been doing is working with Chuck Schumer, Mark Warner, senators uh, in, in D.C., as well as some Republicans on the Jobs and Neighborhood Investment Act. And this will actually create more jobs and funnel additional dollars to those minority small businesses. Uh, this is something that's really ready to go. Uh, as soon as we pay attention to a, a new stimulus package for the country, which we desperately need, this will be a cornerstone of that legislation. And, and we've been working across the aisles, Republicans and Democrats, to get this done. You know, it seems like a lot of these big companies are taking care of it and not necessarily our small companies. You see all these mom and pop businesses closing, a lot of minority owned businesses, black businesses closing. But then you look at companies like your Amazons, your Deltas, your Goodyears and 
lot of these large corporations that get bailouts, they get help, and they're not even paying any federal tax. So, so how do we combat that? So one of the things we uh, advised Biden on and his economic plan was to set $100 billion aside for these community development financial institutions or CDFIs. Those are just small neighborhood banks in black communities have it dedicated to them. So things like that, you have, if you don't call our specific dollars, they never get them because they can't compete with these big companies, the big course. banks. And so he adopted that. Uh, his economic team has actually been pretty good in listening to our ideas. So we got four or five things like that put in the program. Question for Tony and Charles. You know, uh, can black people, small business, their way out of poverty? Some people say yes, some people say no. W w what do you think? I think they can. I think we all can. I think, you know, look, I, I, none of us were born rich. Uh, we all worked our way up uh, from, uh, from the bottom of all of our circumstances. And we just figured out a way to, uh, to learn how the system works and, and uh, operate within the system. So I think absolutely. I mean, if you can create jobs for other people through a mom and pop small business, whether it's a salon or a barbershop, that's economic power right in the community. And we're not talking about Bill Gates' wealth. Yeah, we're not talking about... Well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're we're yeah, you, you got to own something to build wealth. Being just a salaried employee, that's hard. You may be okay, but we need to own things and grow things of our own. Right. But everybody doesn't have to be as rich as Bill Gates. True. But I mean, everybody can't be a business owner either, can they, right? Well, why not? Okay. We could certainly have a lot more than, than we have now. And that's another thing we're going to announce here in January. We're working with HBCUs and connecting them with VCs and private equity companies to get more capital for black people who have a lot of ideas. There's a lot of smart black people out there. They just don't have access and networks. So I think we can create a lot of businesses if we connect those two things. You know, the for the work that Go ahead, Angela. I was just going to ask for the work that the Black Economic Alliance is doing, if you had to compare the Lift Every Voice plan that Joe Biden has to Donald Trump's platinum plan, what are some of the things that are in those plans that you think are along the lines of your work or, or that you would campaign for? So, so let's compare the two plans side by side. Donald Trump is saying that he's actually going to put half a trillion dollars into black businesses, half a trillion dollars. Do, do we really believe that? Mm -hmm. He's See, saying I he's actually going to create half a billion black businesses. Mm -hmm. And there's not been any substantial evidence as to the steps required uh, that the administration will take. And the thing that's actually, that I've actually pondered is why now in 2020 is this coming up for the very first time? Why, why weren't we in this conversation in 2016? If we were having this conversation in 2016, we wouldn't need, have needed to form the Black Economic Alliance. Mm -hmm. What but, about but Joe Biden's Biden, plan? So by Biden's plan, Charles, you want to take that one? Yeah, so his economic team has met with us about three or four times, and I mentioned some of the things we got added. The difference between the plans is Biden is open to advice. He's open to actually a plan and, and data. And so I think his team it will be responsive and actually execute on whatever. Once he gets elected, they'll be open to execute, and we can hold them more accountable. We have no way of holding Trump accountable and believing what he's going to do right now. Right. You know, I saw the, uh, the report that y'all put out uh, this week about undecided black voters in Georgia, South Carolina, and Mississippi, and how they can flip, you know, the U.S. Senate. And, and this question I'm asking, will, will, do you, will black people ever achieve upward economic mobility through voting? And, and if so, how? Voting matters, man. So if you want some of this federal dollars to end up in the black community, you have to be in the room. And the way to be in the room is to elect people that represent you. That's what a lot of this is all about. I've just finished three years of term on the New York Federal Reserve Board, and I've seen what they can do when they are motivated to save the economy, but we don't participate in a big way. So this, I think you, if you get people that represent you and hold them accountable, yeah, we can, we can participate. They should vote. So we've been doing a lot on that front, and basically in Georgia, North Carolina, Michigan, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, those are key swing states. We're running black radio ads, direct mail, literature drops, uh, all sorts of things. Any channel we can reach black people say, you are the majority of the Democratic Party in South Carolina, but not South Carolina, in Georgia and North Carolina. You can decide this. So, but it's, it's difficult right now because of COVID, and we're not used to voting by mail. The last election, only 11% of black people voted by mail, so that's something we're used to doing. And so we got to figure out ways to convince them to drop ballots off and get to the polls and have a plan. So why hasn't it worked before? I mean, we voted, you know, Democrats in countless times. Like, why hasn't that led us to upward economic mobility? Because I, I think we didn't really know to ask. We, we didn't really know to ask. When we sat down and in that, in that uh, meeting that I talked about a, a few minutes ago, 
one of the things we realized is that we, we had all written checks to candidates individually. We'd all been politically active as individuals, but we never took advantage of the collective power of our voice, our vote, and our dollars. And this organization is all about bringing black dollars together to create black wealth, black power, and a black voice that's united behind these kinds of programs. And, and what we've seen is that it makes a big difference. We, we couldn't do this when, when we were supporting Hillary Clinton uh, in, individually. But now that we have a, a group together, people are sitting up and listening. And uh, it makes a big difference. Every other group does this. The Jewish people have APAC, industry associations, professionals. They all get together and they hold people accountable because they don't want to go against this entire group. We were too splintered. So this is about mm -hmm. coming together and, and respecting us as a group and having a brand that they respect and they have to react to. Right. Yeah, I love what y'all are doing. I mean, honestly, that's why I'm not even mad at what Ice Cube's doing. I'm not mad at what Diddy is doing because I feel like the more people are making noise about it, the more both these parties have to pay attention. Right. You know, right. You, you, ask why Trump probably, you ask why Trump came with a platinum plan, it's probably because of all the noise that black people were making. Yeah, but can we, can we talk about that for just a minute? I mean, I, look, I, I love the economic opportunity that lies ahead for, for everyone in the black community, for all of us. But we got to pay attention to the social justice issues as well. We can't, you know, be extending one hand to, to pull people up without paying attention to the social justice issues, which are real, the real barriers to economic progress. So focusing only on the economic issues isn't enough, which is why we've partnered with the NAACP, the National Urban League, to really spread the message that the power of the vote counts and the power of an economic agenda counts. So I, I just, I think these twin engines of progress are, are the things that stand in our way uh, from being successful as black Americans. I wonder if we need the economic part to eliminate, I'm not gonna say eliminate, because you'll never eliminate it, but to counter the social justice part because you know the more money we have then we can participate in politics in different ways and support elected officials that we want in to, to create legislation to protect us as far as our civil liberties are concerned well there's something to that when we raised about 10 million dollars for the for the midterm elections and started donating directly to candidates and holding them accountable and making them fill out surveys on our issues and evaluating them all of a sudden they started listening very closely mm -hmm. so uh that's just the way politics work so the fact that we put our money together and they wanted it uh we had to, we can hold them accountable now some candidates said we don't even need your money we just want your endorsement right wow. and that's the kind of power that we need Absolutely. What about now we this? have senators calling us, asking us our opinion on legislation, giving us draft legislation to, to work on. We've never had that before. Wow. That's great. That shows yeah, the real power we can have. What do you think about people who are turned off by Joe Biden because of these uh, high taxes if you make over $400,000 a year? Okay, this is, <laughs> this is not home now. Though. <laughs> yeah, I want you to break that down so people can understand yeah. what that tax exactly is, you know, and how it gets applied and all of that. Okay, so so Joe Biden's got an aggressive agenda, and, and I'm going to take the first half. Charles was going to take the second half, but he, here's what I'll say. He's got an aggressive agenda, and he plans to pay for it by in, increasing corporate tax, right, which generally won't affect any individual. And what happens in terms of personal taxes if you make less than $400,000 a year, your taxes will not go up. I mean, let me say it again. If you make less than $400,000 a year, your taxes will not go up. So the top 1% of this country makes $400,000 or more. And that's where the tax increase is going to come. So it's a good problem to have if your taxes go up because that means that you're making a lot of money. But if you are below that $400,000 level, your taxes will not go up. Okay, and that's, that's it. it. I don't think that's right. And the reason I say that is, as you look at, at, at generational wealth, right? Like uh, I, I know for myself and I'm, I'm sure for Charlemagne and I'm sure for you, we're the first ones in our family to really start making money, right? So we could be the ones that just start making money and just make $500,000. And if you tax me 62%, we're still so far behind because you got somebody, let's say like a Donald Trump that can say, hey dad, give me a million dollar loan. I can't ask my dad for a million dollar loan. I, I could barely get anything. And, and if you continue to tax without allowing me to create generational wealth, allowing me to build businesses for my family and my community, I don't think that's necessarily right when you have all these huge corporations, like I named before. Yeah, yeah. This was an area of debate that we had with them too. So I'm more in your, your camp, to be honest with you. 
corporate tax I'm okay with because Trump's original proposal was 25%. We didn't need to do it, go to 21%. Take it back to 25. They won't do 28. Okay, corporations won't miss that. They won't change their behavior. Correct. On the individual tax, I actually don't think we can tax our way out of this situation. We got to grow the economy. I would rather have put more money into the economy, more businesses and recirculate a little bit more, let people spend that money in, in their local communities. Uh, but everybody has a different view of it. The 400,000 is kind of a number, but you got payroll tax, other things around it that kind of make it start to creep up. So that's one we're probably going to have to continue to talk to them on. We'll see how that evolves, but I, I hear you on the taxes. Because yeah. how, how do we catch up? Like, how do we get to where America is? You know what I mean? We, we, you know, we, we talk about it now. It's just starting to see more and more black millionaires and starting to see more and more black women millionaires. And how do we possibly catch up when they, it seems like their lead is so far in advance. They could be like, ah, oh, take 62%, but 62% for somebody like us that's taking care of mama, papa, grandmama, grandpapa, aunties, uncles, it makes it more difficult. But isn't this before your write-offs too? Like, aren't you able to write a lot of things off? Because nobody pays their full taxes. We all have things that we, uh, you know, business expenses hey, you and speak donations. For yeah, I pay my full taxes. I pay my full taxes. No, I'm saying, everybody has write-offs. <laughs> No, I no, mean, no. if Come you on. make donations, Angela, you Angela, can... Angela, I got you. I got yeah, you. Yeah, you can write I mean, that we, off. We all, know, we all know we have deductions. Yeah, right? absolutely. And we take our that deductions. Not be and smart our not to. Yeah, our deductions lower our effective tax rate. Mm -hmm. And that's also contemplated uh, in the Biden plan. So, hey, I, I hear you, man. I, I hear you absolutely on, on, you know, how will we ever get ahead. Here's one thing that, that's really quite interesting. We could add 4 to 6% to this country's GDP, which means that America would get richer if we could close the racial wealth gap. So the idea here is to elevate everybody, uh, close that wealth gap with white Americans, and then America benefits as, as well as we benefit. The question is, how are we gonna advance the social justice agenda and whose responsibility is that? Some people argue, hey, I got mine and I'm, I'm just looking out for my own. Mm -hmm. And I personally fundamentally don't think that's right. I think we have an obligation to give back. And, and that's a so personal, makes a good that's point. A personal thing. The, the way we got these businesses interested in hiring more black people is just showing the numbers. Look, these are your future customers. These are your future employees, whether you like it or not. The, the demographics are changing. This is good for you. It's a, business, it's a good business decision. You need to train these black people so they have more money to spend, buy houses, buy your stuff. And so I think it's changing people's mentality as thinking as time goes on. No, I, I, yeah, I, I don't I think, think people should pay. I'm sorry, so I'm missing my mm -hmm. last thing. I think people should pay, and I don't have a problem with that. But when you have companies that make billions and pay zero, but then you say, okay, this person that is, is a first time, this has to pay 62% or whatever amount he has to pay. I don't, I don't yeah, think that's, that's right. You, you that let was Netflix, one of the recommendations. Amazon, we said tax simplification. Just come up with a simple tax rate. For we, all, we all agree. Good year. We, we, all agree. we all agree. Donald Trump. None of those are black companies. They're all white companies. Yeah. IBM, <laughs> all US agree. Steel, Whirlpool. But yeah, but we're going we're gonna to tax you, the personal person, but the company that's making billions, now we let you live? No, that ain't, that's, no. not, that's not right. No, we, we, we totally we agree. agree. We totally agree. And that, that's why Biden is, is proposing that the corporate tax rate goes back up. Charles is right. 25, it used to be 30, 35%. And they lowered it to 21%, was, which was way too low under Trump. So look, most businesses were expecting that it would go to 28%. Trump gave them seven points. So now it's at 21. And what Biden wants to do is take it back to 25. I think that's a fair shake. Yeah, yeah, I don't have a complex tax codes company will figure out how to gain the system. So the only way you can do this is simplify your taxes. Just your, your rate is 25%. I don't want to hear any discussion on it. But whatever the number is, and you yeah. raise more, and everybody knows what it is, and it's predictable, it's fine. But if you add all these loopholes and all these lobbyists, you, could, you will never be able to control it. That's yeah, what I, happened. I don't think it's going to happen anyway. Though. I mean, Obama, Obama and Biden had sweet tax breaks for the rich, and Biden gets spe special interest money from corporations. So I, I, do you really think he's going to tax these corporations? I do. I do think he will raise the tax rate. I don't, <laughs> I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see it. And, and look, Charles and I are both in one businesses that will be affected. Uh, yeah, by look, that. I, how do y'all think the raising the corporate tax rate on me? How, how do y'all think the world would differ if Martin Luther King Jr. was able to execute his, his poor people's march, the poor people's campaign? You know, I, you know, remember, I mean, that was, that was the, the big thing right before he was assassinated. And, and that was all about closing the wealth gap. And it wasn't only about closing the wealth gap between black Americans and white Americans. It was about closing the wealth gap for all Americans. And that included a lot of white folks. That would have generated a lot of political power if he had been able to do that. Some theorize that that's exactly why he was assassinated, mm -hmm. because his base of support was going to expand. I don't know whether that's true or not. 
But if we had closed the racial wealth gap uh, as a result of that work back in 1968 when he was assassinated, think about where we would be. Think about how much farther ahead the United States would be. I mean, that projection of four to six percent of the GDP that we talked about a moment ago, we could have achieved that 10, 15, 20 years or so ago. And we'd be well, in 1968, to your point, the home ownership rate for black people in 1968 was 41%. And guess what it is today? 41%. We made no progress. Mm. And because it, all, it always makes me wonder, like, if you're fighting for social justice, civil rights, it seems like it's cool. But you start fighting for the economic empowerment of black people, then they really have a problem with you. Uh, we're finding that out, but they're waking up, and uh, we, we didn't have a voice on this topic because they didn't, it's not something we normally talk about. They all only had to deal with social justice issues, and now that we're bringing this up, no one looked at the black economy. So we like to say we're Black America's auditor. The way LDF is a Black America's lawyer, you need somebody looking at the balance sheet and the income statement, knowing where the money is going. There's a lot of money being spent. We just got to make sure we get ours. How do you respond to Jared Kushner's remarks where he says... Um, about black people, he, that Donald Trump can't want them to be successful more than they want to be successful. Well, well so, that, so let's go back to the, the comments in general about this whole idea of extending a hand to pull people upward economically and pushing down on their heads on the social justice issues. How will people truly get ahead? We want to lift you up economically, but we're not going to do anything to improve the systemic and structural racism that's existed in this country. That, that doesn't make sense. You got to do both. And, and this administration has been absolutely unwilling to address the social justice issues. True. I, I think we can all agree, too, that black people deserve reparations. Right. But what does that look like? What's something that we could tangibly get done? No taxes for black people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so think about this, okay, think about it in terms of maybe, maybe black economic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we know is that in the new economy, which Charles and I both represent, I represent biotech, Charles represents high tech or in software, and these are the new economy industries. It's estimated that 60% of the jobs that will be lost to new economy jobs disproportionately have blacks in those jobs. Mm. So the unemployment rate for black Americans by 2030 let's say on ordinary times, is expected to be 20 to 25% because of the loss of these jobs to automation. So if we're to, if we're to structure a plan, let's just start with the reskilling of black Americans so they can be prepared for the new economy jobs that we know are coming. These are jobs that, uh, we, there's no surprise, these jobs are coming. Let's reskill, train, offer an opportunity to retool the skill sets of black Americans so we can compete effectively for those jobs that are coming. 60% of those jobs are going to be lost and we're in those jobs. We can do that. We can fix that today. That's why we're so focused on job training because that's the thing we can do it at scale that affects a lot of mm -hmm. people. So we want companies to publish how many black people work for them, what jobs that they're in commit to hiring a certain percentage of them. And that uh, network, that black network I told you about, we're gonna have them contribute to the, net, the network and connect directly and hire these people year after year after year with numbers behind it. So and if what, you want one thing that we could do to affect a lot of black people is put them in good jobs. And what are the right jobs? So the ones that we're focused on is uh, technology and software, uh, some construction jobs, healthcare is gonna be a big area and advanced manufacturing. Those four sectors, if you look at any ec economic report, are gonna be growing for years to come. I agree with you, and I, I think trade school too. I think they need to have like some type of free trade school program for kids who don't necessarily wanna to go to college. So we wanna connect them directly to high schools. So these companies, that's one of our recommendations. Put your, your requirements in these high schools where you hire from, and so they know they have a job. They're getting that training in their 11th and 12th grade before they graduate. So hire for skills, not degrees. And they're starting to get that because they over-credentialize these jobs. So you need a college degree for things you don't need a college degree for. And so now they get that. So we're saying, this guy can learn this. He didn't go to college, but give him eight weeks of training. He's got it. So can I, let me just add a couple of things too. I think we need to be providing access to capital to fix that home ownership number that Charles mm -hmm. uh, mentioned a moment ago. It hasn't changed in 55 years. Mm -hmm. The white home ownership level is 71% compared to black families, which is 41%. Let's fix that by providing access to credit and access to capital so more Blacks can own their own, their own homes. That's been the fastest way to access wealth in this country over the last 60 or 70 years. And Black people have been, uh, have been left out of that. Let's also funnel additional dollars for those people who want to start 
their small businesses, whether they're mom and pop businesses or a software business or a biopharmaceutical company. Uh, you know, let's let's provide the capital that will enable those kinds of entrepreneurial things. I'm an entrepreneur. Ch Charles is an entrepreneur. And we know how important it is. And, and I think this question around how do we fix the, the imbalance and how do we ever catch up by owning equity, by owning right. equity in our own businesses. And, you know, because regular salary is not going to create uh, the vast amounts of wealth that we've seen created in this country. So we've got to own pieces of businesses. Yeah, I love what the Black Economic Alliance is doing, man, because people act like, you know, structural racism, systemic racism isn't the reason that there's this black-white wealth gap. So the only way to close it is by, you know, being part of the system that helps to fix it. Yeah. And like I said, we need to be in the room and uh, ask the right questions. So sometimes they just haven't thought about this stuff. They've been doing it the same way for so many years. And that's right. when you bring it up, you see the stunned look on their faces. So that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. Y'all like, Negro, Negroes want money? <laughs> you, you know what they say, if, if, you're, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. That's right. And we have been on the menu for a long time. It's now time for us to be at the table. And we're at the yeah. table. No idea how many politicians come to us and go, give us a black economic platform. We don't have one because they just haven't thought about it. So we wow. just give it to them. Right. Wow. What we think so how can people reach y'all or connect with y'all? Like, what's the call to action? So the call to action is go, go online, visit the website at blackeconomicalliance.org. Follow us on social media. And uh, look, a, a $5 contribution helps. That, that will be put to good use. We'll get out the vote. And we'll keep supporting the candidates who support what we support, which is work wages and wealth for black America. So just uh, spread the word. There's a group of folks who are working on behalf of all black Americans trying to create economic opportunities for us. Uh, we don't want anything except the best for the black community. That's what we want. All right. And what's the website again? Blackeconomicalliance.org. Okay. Blackeconomicalliance.org. Tony, Charles, thank you very much. Thank you for joining right, us. Right, right, I appreciate it. Peace. 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 Peace.